so uh, I, I will be talking not about what Akshara does, but what I think we all should be doing together. And that's really uh, the, the crux of uh, my talk here. So uh, we start in 1967, a U.S. plant pathologist by name William Paddock and his son, Paul, they co-authored a book called Famine 1975, you know, America's decision, who will survive? And if you read that book, uh, they actually advocate that U.S. aid dollars should not be given to a country like India, where there is really no chance of feeding all the population. So let the people of India starve, and let the aid dollars be given to countries where there is a good, better chance of them sur surviving. This was 1967, and this book uh, is still available on Amazon. Uh, in 1967, the population of India was 504 million. Today, we are 1.2 billion, and as a country, we are still open for business. So clearly, uh, the paddocks were wrong in their assumption that this is going to be a failed country. But it goes back to the fact that everyone had given up simply because what they saw as a large population, a growing population, and really, can we do anything about it? What does this have to do with education? Last year, the International Monetary Fund in its regional economic outlook, about the same time, in April 2012, said clearly that India's demographic transition is presently well underway. And the age structure of the population is likely to evolve favorably over the next two to three decades. So really, what it tells us is that we have about 20 years Maybe you can stretch it to 30 years, but that's about the time frame we have in which to reap this thing, uh, this mythical thing called the demographic dividend. Everyone talks about the demographic dividend, and we have to do something about it. Talking is not going to be enough. So we have about uh, two decades uh, to make that happen. The IMF, of course, talks in terms of can we do e economic and trade reforms, but we all know in this room that at the bottom of it all, what we really need is reforms in our education system. And not only higher education, but we are talking about starting at the preschool and at the primary school level. So, you know, if we don't have that firmly in place, higher education alone is not going to do uh, a lot of good, right? So why is education really important? Uh, this is a... Uh, a a little booklet uh, called The High Cost of Low Educational Performance. And the authors of this is, uh, one is a Stanford professor, Hanushek, and the other one is a professor from uh, Munich called Woosman. And essentially it says that an improvement of one half po uh, uh, point in uh, standard deviation in the learning outcomes of math and science will actually translate into 0.87% in GDP growth. Now, this has been backed up by these two professors with data over, I believe, 20 years. So it's over a historical uh, period that they have actually looked at it, and it just forms uh, pretty much a very solid uh, portion of the advocacy being done under the OECD. OECD also runs PISA, and many of us will remember with great amount of shame that two years ago when Himachal Pradesh and Tamil Nadu took part in the PISA test. We came 73 out of 74. 74 was a country called Kyrgyzstan. And I can challenge most of you in this room, you won't be able to identify Kyrgyzstan on the map of the world. Right? Uh, and uh, Nick last night told me that Kyrgyzstan has gone down from the earlier Soviet days when they were much better. So, uh, so you can imagine where we are, uh, really. Uh, so uh, what is this thing that troubles our education system? The most widely quoted thing is the annual status of education report, right? ASAR, which has been done every year from 2005, uh, and Akshara has uh, been anchoring it in uh, Karnataka. Essentially, it says that six out of ten students in class five, cannot read a grade two text, right? And in the context of the whole country, we are talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100 million children who will be unable to read 
despite being in primary school for several years. If you go down, 8 out of 10 students can't do simple division. And in many parts, even in Karnataka, you see that number even lower. I've seen numbers, uh, if you analyze it district by district, there are some numbers that are about 12% can do division. So it's really that, you know, almost saying that nobody can do division. I mean, it's just one or two out of ten that can do division. And uh, if you then look at both the ASAR and what is called the DICE data, DICE is something that you should all be familiar with. It is something that's published by the National University of Education, Planning and Administration. And they have a large database of all kinds of data about education in this country, specifically primary education. Not so much, nothing in the preschool or in the high school area yet, but very clearly in the, uh, pre uh, in the primary uh, school education. And 56% of the schools don't have a usable toilet. 18% don't have drinking water, right? And 60% don't have a toilet for girls. So I think Reduka was here talking about the importance of hygiene and so on. So we spend lots of money uh, after the fact of getting the girl child back into school when we can simply plug it by having usable girl uh, toilets for girls right at the beginning. I mean, we always uh, spend money after the fact. So one could argue, if you look at all these numbers, one could really argue and say that perhaps one of the biggest impediments to education here is the lack of accountability at every level uh, in the system. Uh, there have been several studies, uh, Karthik Murli Dharan, Geeta Kingdon, all have published lots of information and papers that say that uh, about 25 to 30 percent of the teachers are not there at work when they are supposed to be. And that, that's uh, one of the big papers. Uh, also, teachers, rather than focusing on learning outcomes, are more interested in, you know, getting the lesson plan signed off by their superiors. And this kind of accountability kind of strips all along to the top. So this has been the general perception. All of this is from the supply side. On the other side, parents are illiterate, never been to school. They don't know whether their children are learning or not learning. Uh, they see the child going to school with uniform, with books, with bag, with shoes. They get a midday meal. They are assuming everything is fine because they can't judge if the child is learning or not learning. So the quality of demand itself in terms of learning is very low. So the, the problem for us all together is how do we get all these things working together? How do you shift the locus of control from the supply side to the demand side? That's If we can accomplish something of that sort, I think we are on a good wicket, right? But this is not a problem that any one of our entities in this room, no matter how big we are, can accomplish on our own. Uh, but at Akshara, we do have, we have been working on, quietly on an interesting innovation. Uh, we have a solution, which we call the Karnataka Learning Partnership. The Karnataka Learning Partnership is been designed uh, around children and for use by uh, the entire gamut of stakeholders in the system. So first, we believe that all the organizations here and many more outside who are not in this room and government can work together uh, to collect information. And all that information and data can be woven into a story. And that story can be used to galvanize change in the communities. So that's one clear uh, uh, design element of uh, the Karnataka Learning uh, Partnership. Second, and this is more interesting, is we've had lots of us who have bypassed the government school systems or the public school systems. Uh, we are now working. We are now earning well. Uh, we are paying our taxes, and those taxes pay for the upkeep of the system. But we are never put our head inside any one of these anganwadis or schools because it doesn't impact us. But that is changing. The younger generation is more and more tuned into saying, what can I do? 
So we have a little public schools and preschools in Karnataka, but don't know how to find them. Visit kip.org.in. Click on map and search for schools or preschools in your area. Pay a visit, volunteer, help out, or just look around and observe. If you visited a school, do come back and share your experience with us. Click on map and locate the school or preschool that you visited. Click on share your story and give us your feedback. You could also submit pictures and comments. Please remember to leave us your details so we can follow up with you. Everything you share with us is reviewed, approved, and collated and helps the government make better decisions. Like installing more toilets or supplying more books or generally improving the quality of our schools. Come, engage with us and help us make our schools better for our children. So, uh, last year we had, for example, or this past year, we've had about uh, 3,500 3, people who actually visited schools and submitted uh, their comments on the Share Your Story. But 3,500 in the context of 68 million people in this state and 9.5 million in this city is very tiny. So hopefully next year we are saying, can we set ourselves a goal of doing 3,500 every month? Because if you have 30, 40, 50,000 uh, inputs, you are able to actually have many more data points that are useful for several things. What do we do with this? Uh, last year we started an experiment of giving simple two-page reports to our elected representatives. Uh, we had a lot of data for Bangalore, so we broke it down by their constituency. Uh, the five MPs and the 28 MLAs of Bangalore. They got uh, reports like this from us. Uh, we had assumed that they would just throw it away. Uh, but this was a revelation to us. Uh, six or seven of the MLAs have actually invested parts of their local area development funds into improving facilities in Anganwadis and in primary schools. The MPs have been a little away from it. But then 2014 is coming, we'll catch them very soon, right? So, uh, and right after 2014, Bangalore will have its, uh, you know, municipal corporation election. So we'll catch the corporators. So I think when there is a need, people do uh, react to it. Uh, during this past uh, state assembly elections, we located all 170 candidates who stood for election in Bangalore, although there are only 28 seats and delivered constituency-wise reports to them. And we've gone through some very interesting experiences. Uh, m some of them, the minute you walk into the room, would shut the latch. Because the conversation then is, how many votes, kitna paisa? You know, so that was one conversation we've encountered. Uh, there's some, one party actually offered us so many rupees per every Facebook like. So, so there's a lot of this. So th what it's actually telling you, you know, f while we can laugh at it, what it's actually telling you that the elected representatives are concerned. It's just that nobody's ever reached out to them and talked to them and helped them, you know, plan uh, things for them. So, so that's uh, 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 one thing. The academic community can work on collecting information uh, and since we have multiple data sets, where do these data sets come from? A lot of it is from other nonprofits working in Karnataka. Uh, for example, we already have Akshay Patra's data on our site. Uh, in the next uh, few weeks, we will have the Sikshana data on our site. We have information from Pratham Mysore on the site. So we already have a small momentum going towards it. And for us, the dream would be if every organization that's in this room and working in Bangalore, in Karnataka is able to give us that information of what they do, we can be uh, very effective, put these data sets up, so that then researchers can look at multiple data sets and start to create papers, white papers, 
uh, recommendations for reforms in the education system, and actually all of this will be data-based evidence rather than anecdotal. However, having said that, what about parents? This is the constituency that's not online. This is the constituency that's not familiar with computers, uh, with the internet, uh, you know, for, for, and, and just, they just don't have access to all this. So how do we go about, this is clearly a constituency that has no choice and no voice. And the further away you go from Bangalore, the more you see of this. There is no choice and there's no voice. So how do we go about addressing them? Uh, at KLP, we have started to work on using cell phone-based applications, uh, which will be piloted over the next two or three months and hopefully fully launched by the end of the year. So that, because everyone has a phone, everyone knows how to talk. Uh, if there is one thing that we are famous for, we are argumentative Indians. <laughs> so all of us know really how to talk well. Uh, so we should be able to collect a lot of information from parents using voice-based uh, you know, inputs into the KLP system. So that's something that uh, we are working on right now. What's next? Currently on the KLP site, which you can visit uh, as that little video clip showed you by going to uh, klp.org.in, we have information on approximately 16,000 schools. Uh, our database has over 850,000 children uh, for Bangalore and for parts of the state where Akshara has been working. Uh, we have information both on primary schools and in Anganwadis. Uh, in, at least in the primary school system, there's an, there's an SSA. There is no SSA in the women and child development. So there is really no body of knowledge there in the Anganwadi system, which we have. Uh, and perhaps we can scale that uh, up uh, across the state. In three years, we want to see a dozen different NGOs and government agencies. Currently, we are getting information from the SSLC board. We are getting information from the government of Karnataka. We are tapping into DICE. Uh, in terms of uh, non-state actors, there are people like Accountability Initiative, India Governs Research Institute, who are helping us with their data sets. And then... Akshara generates its own information because of the programs that we do. And then Akshay Patra comes in and Shikshana comes in. And hopefully all of you here in this room will be able to actually uh, give us information. In three years, we are hoping that all MPs, MLAs, municipal councillors and panchayats in the entire state will get some kind of a report from KLP with respect to their own constituencies. So this is a community that's approximately 6,500 people. Uh, 5,900 panchayats, 228 MLAs, I think close to 30 MPs, and then the municipal, you know, so, so it's a large constituency that we hope to impact at different levels, at the local level, at the panchayat, and at the highest level in parliament. So we are able to uh, give them reports. Uh, state, in, within the state, educators, starting from the cluster level all the way up to the state level, there are many people in the hierarchy who can benefit from having this information, both for their planning and for creating effective measures of learning outcomes over time. We are hoping that parents will share their concerns using these cell phone, cell phone applications, and we expect to do over 100,000 parents a year. Again, you know, in the context of our country's numbers, 100,000 might seem small, but you know, if you think about it, it can be a very large and daunting number. We are also hoping to generate about 10,000 to 20,000 young youth from colleges uh, who can become community, uh, you know, volunteers and get actively involved in, in schools across the state. So also with companies and academia would benefit from all the data that we've collected. So all of this we are looking at can we improve learning outcomes of our children so that they can be, somebody said education, employment, employability? Is that yours? Yeah, so we're talking about uh, all of that. H.G. Wells, remember most of us uh, have read H.G. Wells when we were small. He essentially said that human history becomes more and more 
a race between education and catastrophe. Okay? And finally, uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, the economists said this. They said, India's century is not an inevitability. It is a giant opportunity that India is in danger of squandering. So please do think about it. Together we can. Thank you.